I, th I think there's a certain amount of, of eyeballing in there. Oh my God, I can't believe that. <laughs> Mind blown. <laughs> Hello, everybody. We are back for another episode of Ask the Test Kitchen. I am Keith, and I'm here with... Christy. Hi, Christy. Hi, Keith. How are you? I'm great. How great. are you? So, do you want to start? Or sure. do you want Or do you want me to start? Uh, I'll start. Okay, good. We're going to answer some questions and, you know, see if Keith is on top of things. Really today. hard questions. Yes. Actually, I'm kidding. Just give me some easy questions. <laughs> Yargos asks... Why do some leftover cookies soften readily in the microwave, but others, like macadamia nut cookies, harden after reheating, becoming more stale than they were before? Um, so uh, this is a good question. I'm, I'm kind of thrown off by the, the microwave. Um, so, so you bake some cookies and you want to soften them up again, so you heat them in the microwave. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm assuming that that at a certain point, a leftover cookie will be so stale that it won't soften because, <laughs> because you know, the, there's no moisture in right. it. it it's, it's, it's so old that, that you really can't do anything. Um, you know, maybe you're driving off too much moisture. Right. Um, well, because your microwave, microwave is, is searching for the moisture in the cookie yeah, to make it Yeah, that's how that's going to move right? that moisture around to kind of to warm it back up. Yeah. Um, so that it's, I, I think it, I mean, it, 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 it's going to depend on the type so of cookie. So there's, there's zombie cookies that come back. <laughs> and then <laughs> there's some cookies. cookies that are just goners. Goners, and yeah, they're not going to come there's back. There's just no way. <laughs> yeah, I, my, I, I mean, I guess I never have this problem in my house because we never gone. have leftover <laughs> cookies. So, um, I, I mean, if, if you do make cookies and you have a lot that you're not going to eat, rather than having them stay out, I would freeze them, mm -hmm. you know, it, or either freeze the dough or freeze the, the fully baked cookies. Right. So, you, so you don't have to worry about that. Um, and that way you can have freshly baked yeah. cookies. Um, or take them into work and share them with your coworkers, with coworkers. And yeah. then, you know, you'll be very popular. Yes. Yeah. And you don't have to worry about this ever again. <laughs> no more stale cookies. <laughs> okay. okay. Next up. Uh, how do I cook salmon without having that white stuff come out of it? Yeah, oh. I was just actually reading. I that think this is a is, good question. It's a great question. Yeah, it's a, uh, so the white stuff is uh, a protein, albumin. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm assuming that it's the same protein that you would find in egg whites. Mm -hmm. um, it, it just it, it occurs. I, I think that that albumin. Uh, comes it, a lot of it will come out if you're cooking the salmon really quickly. Mm -hmm. uh, what happens? I think that the muscle uh, tissue contracts and it kind of uh, pushes that that albumin out, and you know it hits a certain temperature and it coagulates. Right. So you get that that white film around it. Mm -hmm. um, so how to mitigate that? So I know brining is is one thing that we found. Right. Um, so uh, a quick salt water solution for 15 minutes. It doesn't take long to brine salmon mm -hmm. uh, is the best way uh, to mitigate some of that. Uh, another way I think is just uh, cooking it more slowly. It's more gentle. Yeah, yeah. So I think if you are, you know, searing it really hard in a saute pan. The, the exterior of that is getting, you know, really cooked in, in really kind of aggressive heat, then mm -hmm. you're kind of um, shrinking those muscle fibers and squeezing out that albumin. So, uh, yeah, slow and, and low if, if possible, um, and, and a quick brine. Yeah. So, yeah. And the brine is, what is it, like a tablespoon of salt per cup of water? Yeah, like that, that. Sounds, that sounds about right. I mean, um, you know, you're, you're probably going to do a little bit more volume. So you're talking maybe a, a quarter cup of salt mm -hmm. to um, maybe a quart of water right. around there. I mean, if, if the we can, uh, we can link to that uh, brining yeah. for salmon. Uh, it, and it's really quick. It's mm -hmm. not like uh, pork where you need like an hour or so or two hours. Uh, it's 15 minutes. Uh, mm -hmm. So if you're going to cook salmon a lot, then brining is certainly a way to go. And plus, there are so many other benefits to brining too, uh, right. other than the albumin. It's going to make it taste it's, really good. Yeah, and, and, and make it moisture too. Yeah. So uh, it's really kind of a win win. Win win. Win. Yeah. Three wins. This is from, let's see, my, my old eyes are failing me here. Uh, <laughs> this is from Charisma23. Do you use a trick preset thermometer when you film? That, I mean, this is a longer question, but right. I think that, that's what she's at, you know, asking. Do we fake people up? Well, okay. <laughs> we didn't <laughs> used to. 
okay? Yeah, yep. Yeah, For the right. longest time, let me tell you, because Keith and I have both, he still does, I used to, both worked in our back kitchen during TV, so as sort of like culinary producers, I yeah, guess. Yeah. And so, you know, if we were making a prime rib, an expensive prime rib, and we wanted to, you know, show cooking it through and making sure we could temp it, we would have three, maybe yeah. four prime ribs going staggered time, staggered cooking times, yeah. so that, you know, we were ready if we were ahead of time, if we were behind schedule, we would have one of those prime ribs that would be perfect to temp at exactly the temperature we wanted at that precise time. Mm. That's a lot of money it, to yeah. get an authentic read on a thermometer. Yeah, yeah. And that's a lot of time spent in ovens. That's a lot of oven space that's that's like real estate that we're we're devoting to this one recipe. So about three or four yeah, I years think so. ago. Yeah, maybe a little bit longer than that. Yeah. We got a special thermo pen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. A very special thermo A thermo very pen. special one. It does have a little kind of button on the back and we can set it for the temperature that we're you know, that we're looking for in that moment. Um, although the the roast that we're actually cutting into at the end is always going to be yes, exactly perfect, where it yeah, should be yeah. and have rested as long as it needs to. But, but, it's, but it's not like we're cooking these things like super well done. No, no, and, no. And just saying, no. oh, just put it out there and you can get the temperature with the magic <laughs> moment. I mean, they're, they're we got pretty... this dried out old <laughs> roast yeah, so you can throw roast. out there. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's going to read 125, yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, we, we, we do try to get it so we wouldn't have to use that thermometer. Right. It, it really is a backup plan and mm -hmm. like you said you know it's it's much easier to roast like two prime ribs uh -huh. as opposed to four right you know so it, it really is a, a cost saver and right. a time saver for and us and you'll have the, the test cook who's in charge of the recipe will be like kicking themselves like oh i'm so sorry it was supposed to be 120 and it's like 117 yeah. you know yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, we're not perfectionists calm down <laughs> calm down it's okay yeah, yeah. <laughs> So, you know, we don't want to have all of that self-flagellation going on. So we got the tricky, the tricky <laughs> thermometer and everybody's happier. <laughs> okay, let's see. What else can we do here? The Cook's Illustrated Lemon Olive Oil Tart. The oil in the filling, so we have a, a really great olive oil tart that Andrea Gary developed a couple years back. Uh, super simple tart, super mm -hmm. flavorful, uh, very lemony. Um, but the olive oil and the filling from the custard, it has like a, um, it's like a lemon custard, curd. a lemon curd, yeah, exactly made with olive oil. Um, so the olive oil and the filling separated from the custard during baking, and the top of my tart looked greasy and had a grainy pockmarked texture on the surface. Any ideas what could, could, could have gone wrong? Well, I, my, first, my first instinct is that the curd was overcooked. You know, whether you took it a little too far, um, because you do start it on the stovetop, yep. and then, uh, I mean, you don't take it till it's really thick on the stovetop, and then um, add it to the pie, the pie, uh, the tart shell, and then bake it a little bit longer. So either you cooked it a little too long on the stovetop, or your oven temperature might not be accurate, um, which leads us to the, you should have an oven thermometer because most ovens aren't consistent. Yeah, I think we found that sometimes ovens can be off 50 degrees. Right. So yeah, yeah. That, that's a significant yeah, temperature. Yeah, I think that's like, if you've moved into a new apartment, you know, you've yeah. changed houses, even, you know, like taking your oven from one house to another and, you know, might have jostled something, yeah. just, Grab, get a, what are they, $5, $10? Yeah, I, th I think something like that. And, and put it in your oven and, and that will, you know, you can, and then definitely adjust your oven temperature based on what that yes, tells you. Yes. Don't just put it in there. If it <laughs> yeah. tells you that the oven is 500 degrees, then, you know, you're going to want to tweak, <laughs> <laughs> tweak your temperature a little bit. A little bit. Just yeah. a little bit. <laughs> but I think that's probably what happened. Okay, this is from Chef Reggiano. What tool is best for pureed starchy vegetables? Handheld blender, food processor, or blender? Hmm. Hmm. I, I think it would depend on the starchy vegetable you're talking about. Um, I mean, if, if it's a potato, I, I don't think any of those would be really good because you're gonna work the potatoes too much and potentially make them gluey. Mm -hmm. uh, if you're talking about- um, Like butternut squash or yeah, something like or, that. Yeah, or parsnips or celery root. Right. Um, I, I would say food processor. Right. Um, a handheld blender and a, and a regular blender, 
I think are good for uh, like pureed soups that, that there's a lot more liquid in mm -hmm. uh, because you have something for those kind of high power blades to kind of work with, get some purchase on and kind of get nice and smooth. Mm -hmm. uh, but if you're looking for a puree, you know, that you could spoon onto a plate, it's gonna have to be drier. And so I think you'd have to go with a food processor. I agree, yeah. I agree. And you're gonna have that blade that really skims the bottom. So it's gonna get all of it as opposed to in the blender where you kind of have some of it that sits underneath yeah, the blade. Yeah, we've all had that And you need a little happen. juicy, liquidy action to yeah, make that work. That, that vortex that yeah. we, we, we like so much. It's too dry. <laughs> we just like to say vortex. Vortex, that's a great word, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, if, if it's too dry, then the blade just kind of spins underneath, mm -hmm. the puree is sitting above it, mm -hmm. um, and nothing happens. So yeah, yeah I, I would go for food processor. So uh, this is a great question. I'm glad this uh, person asked this question because we talk about this a lot uh, during recipe development. Uh, so this is uh, Sandy Sowen. Uh, with a recipe that tells you to reduce a liquid until a certain amount or down to a certain amount, how can you tell? So, I mean, in a perfect world, when we say reduce the sauce to one and a half cups, is that we actually expect people to pour it out of the pan yep. into a measuring cup to make sure it's one and a half cups. Mm -hmm. Now, that said. Do you not do that? So I, 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 I don't. Exposed. <laughs> no, but the thing is, is that I, ha I think I have been cooking long enough in my skillets okay. to say, okay, this looks like about one and a half cups. Right. I mean, I, I, I think there's a certain amount of, of eyeballing in there. Oh my God, I can't believe that. <laughs> Mind blown. <laughs> no, but so so, but, but I don't want people to kind of say that. Okay, that looks like one and a half cups without actually doing it right. several times to say, yeah, okay. You I mean if it's about a half an inch up uh -huh. the side of my skillet, this particular skillet, then you know that it's it's close enough, right? You, you know, um, and so, so that is a that's a good. Um, kind of getting to know your own cookware, you know, the first couple times you do it, maybe, you know, you should have your measuring cup so that you can yeah. check and see what it is. When you put it back in the pan, then you'll see like, oh, okay, that's where, that's what we're talking about. That's my little, you know, yard mark yeah, of ex where exactly. one and a half cups is yeah. on my particular skillet or yeah, saucepan. I, I mean, a, a lot of things that, you know, the rivets on the side of the skillet? Yes. So use that as a benchmark yeah. for, for things, just a visual benchmark. Uh -huh. It's like, oh, it's about a half an inch below the rivet on this skillet. Right. I mean, it's it's a matter of knowing your equipment and, and cooking through right. those things. And also visually understanding is like, oh, this sauce looks thick enough, this sauce looks way too thin. Um, mm -hmm. it, you know, th there is a, a, some experience there, right. you know, but it, you know, if, if you were a new cook starting out right now and you had one of our recipes and it said to reduce it to one and a half cups, get a measuring cup, pour it in there, and that's everything in the skillet, all the solids, if, if there's material in there mm -hmm. other than a liquid, pour everything in there, you know, get a good eye on it and make sure it's, it's properly reduced. Mm -hmm. um, then over time, as you get more experience, then you can eyeball it, like me. Still can't believe this. You, you, uh, no, gonna... no, no, but I also think that, um, no. Do you, do you my... measure it every time? Well, I figure, <laughs> okay. <No. laughs> now, if the recipe says to, you know, reduce until it's it's reduced by half or reduced, you know, whatever. Yeah. Like that, <laughs> you know, you're making a pan sauce. That That's a good, um, a good benchmark and and then you're also looking for the thickness of the sauce a lot of times in our recipes if we if we call out a specific amount that you should be reducing it to it's a lot of times it's because you need that amount to make the next step work exactly yes. so yeah. so you know that is a significant like it is important to make sure that you're that you're using that much whether you're you're pouring it into your measuring cup and and checking it for sure or like Keith you know, the all knowing, <laughs> you just know that your, you know, your medium saucepan at the third rivet holds a cup and a half. You know, wow. <laughs> you should be so lucky. <laughs> You really exposed a lot about me, didn't you? I'm just, I feel like everything I thought I knew about the universe and right from wrong is just all topsy turvy Guys, I now. I measure everything. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, I think we have time for one more question. He's like, please, please, let please. This, let this end. Let this end. <laughs> no. Okay, 
Um, this is from uh, Samsbury17. Sorry, mm. I think I butchered that name. But <laughs> I do not like cilantro. Can parsley be a safe substitute? Is that a safe one? I think that's probably a safe one. It's safe. It's think, safe. Yeah. It's not the same. No. I mean, the, the, fl the flavors are, are very different. The flavors are different, and you're not going to use the stems in parsley like that's you good. might use the stems yeah. in cilantro. Yeah. But um, my mom is a soapy cilantro person, oh, too. Is she? Yeah. yeah, so yeah. I can never put cilantro in things. Yeah. I understand. I'm sorry. I do like cilantro. I mean, par parsley's good. I mean, if, if you, if you want to add green, but not, I mean, parsley is, is fairly bland. Right. You know, it, do right. it doesn't add a lot of characteristics on its own. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I think there are other herbs out there that, that you could probably use that might be appropriate. I mean, scallions. Uh, I mean, it really depends on, on, on the recipe. What did it, um, right. But, I mean, a lot of times in, you know, if we're talking about like Mexican cooking, you use a lot of cilantro. Uh, where chives would be probably be yeah, good, or yeah. or if it's like a Thai recipe and you're adding cilantro, mint might be nice mint. instead. Th um, thai basil, I, right. mean, I, I think there are other herbs that might be appropriate for particular cuisines. Mm -hmm. um, you know, just saying blanket across the board, you know, parsley for cilantro. Um, I guess I would opt to look for other herbs that might be appropriate for that dish, right? Um, to, just to add more flavor than, yeah. than cilantro would you get so. All right. All right. Well, I think that's it. So thank you for tuning in. You feeling okay? I'm feeling okay. I'm going to go measure <laughs> some, some stock right now. Uh, but if you have uh, more questions and for more tips and recipes, you can head over to americastestkitchen.com and find a bunch of information there. Thanks. <laughs> thank you.